Alright, so when we finished reading yesterday, they were going, it said, full steam ahead with the plans for the March on Washington. Does anybody remember what had gone on right before that time to, that kind of had things, maybe not up in the air for the organizers of the march, but kind of had some people not wanting the march to happen. Zala? Uh, the cops were beating a little black kid. Yeah, there was a lot of violence, definitely, and that's what the whole thing was about. But there was something that had happened in Washington, D.C. that was kind of had some people not wanting the march to happen. There was John F. Kennedy was the president. And he had just introduced something to Congress. What had he proposed or introduced to Congress? Ainsley? Um, um, letting black people, like, fight in the war and stuff. Uh, he had introduced a civil rights bill for Congress to pass. And so they didn't, weren't really sure that the march was going to be a good idea because they were afraid that some senators and congressmen would not want to vote for the bill because they would feel like they were being forced to by, because of the march. But they decided, the organizers decided to go ahead and start planning anyway. Bayard Rustin had only two months to plan what was intended to be the largest peaceful demonstration in American history. His job was to organize a protest on a gigantic scale without cell phones, computers, the internet, or much of the technology we take for granted today. So if you wanted to organize something, say you wanted to organize a party, how would your parents likely contact the people that they wanted phone, to invite? Email. Phone, email, what else? Letter. Computer. Computer, what would they use the computer for? Email. Text. Text. Call. Call. Video. Sometimes you send uh, an invitation. Sometimes okay. you do mail invitations. What if you played in a ball game last night? and your parents were really proud of how good you did, what would they probably... Social media. Social media. Snapchat. Do you think social media, Snapchat, Facebook, yeah. Twitter, Instagram, do you think those are ways that information spreads really, really fast now? Yeah. Yeah, social media. We already mentioned emails, text messages. There's information gets spread just like that nowadays. Was it the same way back then? No. No, they didn't have all those options. There, they did have phones. But they were like, but, they, were like house but they had to like, yeah, there were house or landline phones that they had to call. They couldn't just send a text out to. If I want to send a text to fifteen people, I can do that all at the same time, right? Yeah. They couldn't do that. They had to pick up the phone and call each person individually. Or um, Tatum mentioned mail, mailing invitations or handing out invitations. That was the way that they could use also. There were newspapers and news stations, but information was not spread near as quickly as it is nowadays. So that was something that they had to overcome. Within days, he had a tentative plan and a core staff of volunteers. They would be in charge of other volunteers around the country. Both his small office in Washington and the main headquarters in the New York City neighborhood of Harlem received bomb threats daily. Bomb? Why do you think there was in bomb threats to his office, his main office headquarters? What are you thinking, DJ? So he'd stop. Yeah, there were people that didn't want this march to happen. So they were trying to scare them into shutting down their plans. Rustin doodled on his yellow legal pad, his brain going a mile a minute. Within two weeks...
He had a manual and sent it out to sent out two thousand letters to white and black people. It laid detailed groundwork for getting a huge turnout on such short notice. It was a call for action. Miss Wheatley? Yes, ma'am. Could I have Caden? Um, he's in Miss Rook's room. Okay, thank you. Uh-huh. It was a call for action, setting up transportation committees, ways to make the march known, and ways to raise funds. It called for captains aboard every bus, train, and plane. The march was going to cost about $135,000. His staff went after donations from churches, organizations, and individuals. They raised about two-thirds of the money this way. They also sold souvenirs. Many thousands of buttons showing a black hand and a white hand clasped together. They held fundraising concerts or hootenannies with folk singers like Joan Baez and a new gravel voice singer named Bob Dylan. Rustin worked as if he were putting together a huge ad campaign for a new project, new product. The flyers his team mailed out began with the words, An Appeal to You. They sent as many as 100,000 a day with local phone numbers to call for people to sign up. There were spots on radio and TV, interviews on TV talk shows, newspaper and magazine ads, concerts and rallies. Rustin contacted Hollywood celebrities who used their star power to get out the word. The day chosen for the march was a Wednesday. It needed to be on a weekday. Why? Church groups were planning to come in big numbers. But church groups wouldn't skip their Sunday service. Reverend Abraham Wood said, If we didn't have the crowd, it would be perceived that we would have flunked. Rustin's organizers went to all the major cities to work closely with local leaders to do the hard work of signing up marchers and getting them to Washington. In all, some 1,500 groups across the country helped. How did all these people get to the Capitol? Were they all from Washington, D.C. area? No. no. They were from all over the United States. Cars were discouraged as parking would be limited. So Rustin's team began lining up enough buses and trains. How would they keep people comfortable? Memos advised marchers to wear low-heeled shoes and to bring sunglasses, a hat, and a raincoat. Marchers could bring portable stools, and hundreds of folding chairs were supplied for the elderly. What about food? It was okay to bring picnic baskets, box lunches, and thermoses, thermos bottles of water, but no alcohol. The recommended sandwich was peanut butter and jelly. Sandwiches with mayo were no good because they could go bad in the heat. Churches were encouraged to donate lunches. One New York church packed up 80,000 cheese sandwiches, apples, and slices of marble cake. Hot dogs and other food would be sold with large coolers of soda donated by the Coca-Cola company. Some 20 portable drinking fountains were rented. Bathrooms and first aid. Rustin arranged for nearly 300 portable Johnny-on-the-spot toilets. It's like porta-potties. He planned to set up 22 first aid stations with 40 doctors and 80 nurses on hand. What route should the marchers take? They were not going to pass by Congress on Capitol Hill or the White House. This march was about freedom, not politics. Instead, they would, watch, they would walk along the National Mall between two landmarks from the Washington Monument to the Lincoln Memorial. Those monuments were connected by reflecting pools almost a half mile long and a vast lawn. From the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, speakers would address the crowd. Rustin planned an afternoon of inspiring speeches by hand-picked speakers. He soothed the egos of those not chosen. Speeches had to be approved in advance 
and could last no longer than five minutes. Rustin wanted the best sound system available, so the speaker's voices would clearly carry for one square mile. Otherwise, the crowd wouldn't pay attention. Along the mall, miles of wires were laid to carry telephone, television, and radio lines. A big concern was how to keep marchers safe. Rustin worked with Washington's police chief. A vast security force was on standby. 8,900 policemen, firemen, National Guard, and Army members and Marines. In case of a riot, they were armed with guns, clubs, and toxic tear gas. 30 helicopters were also on standby, sent to Washington from Fort Bragg. Washington's main hospital had a disaster plan ready. So I've got a question for you. We've used the word vast, V-A-S-T, vast, twice in the last few pages. The first time said these monuments were connecting by a reflecting pool almost half a mile long and a vast lawn. And then again, it said a vast security force was on standby. What do you think that word means, Sky? Do what? Big. Big. Very good. In addition, Rustin assembled a team of unarmed marshals. They were taught how to control a crowd without force. Also, there would be leaders on every bus to explain to passengers what to do if someone insulted or hit them. They were to ignore it and not fight back. They should leave it to the marshals to respond. There were to be no acts of civil disobedience that could lead to arrest. Over 500 cameramen, technicians, and reporters were to be on hand with more cameras than had filmed the last presidential inauguration. For a month, the president remained silent about the historic event about to take place in the Capitol. Finally, on July 17th, President Kennedy spoke at a press conference in support of the march. Later, he declined to speak at it, but agreed to meet with the leaders that day. By mid-August, there were no more buses available to rent on the East Coast. All scheduled planes, trains, and buses were filled to capacity. Do you think that's a good sign if there were no more buses to rent? And if the planes, trains, and buses were filled to capacity? What does that mean? A bunch of people are planning on coming. The mall was filled with the sounds of carpenters hammering nails into the speaker's platform on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Then, on the night before, someone damaged the sound system. Luckily, U.S. Army sound engineers were able to fix it, working through the night. Up in his hotel room, Martin Luther King Jr. also worked through the night on his speech. The question was, how many people would show up to hear it? 